So uh, I now turn to our guest of honour, Dr Mary McAleese, who hardly needs any introduction, but of course we'll get an introduction. Um, it has to be said that you've been one of the beacons of light for Irish LGBTI people for many years. From your early involvement in the campaign for homosexual law reform to your powerful contributions during the Yes Equality campaign last year. Your kind, compassionate and considered words both during and since your presidency have been a source of hope and comfort for the citizens of Ireland, both LGBTI and non-LGBTI alike. And we really thank you very much for this. In Ishkurum Falcha, Riv Ir Uchtaran Heron and Dr. Mora Vikili Isa, a Tokun Lauert Lin, Fundurishk Nuisha, a Kastokun a Hyola Kahifagul Dun in you. I now invite former President of Ireland, Dr. Mary McAleese, who's going to speak to you about her thoughts on the LGBT Ireland report and who's going to launch it officially for us. So please give Dr. McAleese a very warm welcome. <laughs> Just looking round these walls, I'm thinking here we are in a centre of scholarship, a place, the Academy, the Royal Irish Academy. All these volumes speak of a place that values science, social science, the pursuit of research, the finding of answers to human problems, the pushing out of the boundaries of knowledge. And we are here, I hope, today to launch a report which will be, it's a very heavy report, <laughs> in every way. It's physically heavy, but inside what we'll read here should lie heavy and heavily on our consciences. But heavy though it is, I'm hoping that like a lot of the books around here that made changes in Irish society over time, this will be a leaven. This will be a leavening agent in our country. That's what it's designed to be. Uh, we've heard mention of that wonderful day on uh, May 23rd when we woke up and started doing the counting, uh, when Ireland counted the votes on the referendum on marriage equality and revealed to itself, I think, and to the world that here was a country wholeheartedly committed to the equal civil and human rights of, uh, on that day, yes, clearly our lesbian and gay community, but I also like to think our LGBTI community. And it was a stunning victory, a great victory for fairness, for solidarity, and I hope a massive reassurance to a community which daily experiences here and right around the world levels of exclusion, of suffering, of fear, violence, oppression, self-doubt, and prejudice enough to test and even break the strongest human spirit. Um, I believe very firmly that it was the telling of individual stories, uh, like those of Daniel and Kira. Um, it was the telling of those stories that provoked conversations around tables all over this country and provoked also changes of heart and led to that overwhelming yes vote. Um, many people were shocked at the level of fear-filled secrecy that had shrouded and clouded the lives of even very well-known public figures, people who looked and presented to be confident in themselves. But in telling their stories, we realised that there was this big vacant space inside um, of suffering. Uh, but even on that day of grace, and it was, I think, a fantastically grace-filled day, May 23rd, uh, when joy flooded the country, I keep forgetting about May 22nd, I mean that was the day when we did the business, but for me the big day of joy was the 23rd when we did the counting. But even on that day, uh, you know, when that great tsunami of joy flooded the country, we knew that we were dealing with a long-standing architecture of homophobia which has been carefully implanted from generation to generation, from century to century, into so many hearts, in attitudes, in practices, in beliefs, that we knew then it was going to take many more years to dismantle. It's the work of generations. During the referendum campaign, and I apologize to those of you who have already heard this story, but um, I received 
not funny enough, very, very few um, um, critical letters, but I did receive one very, just one, really, really disturbing letter. It has come between me and my night's sleep often since, um, um, as the mother of a gay son. It was from the father of a gay son. And in the letter, he described his son as evil, using incorrectly the words from Catholic Church, even very recent Catholic Church documents, um, words that have been used to describe sex between gay partners, but has, have never been used to describe people who are gay. The term intrinsically disordered uh, is used to describe people who are simply gay. Um, and these words, which whether, the, whether it's intrinsically disordered or evil, these words are today scientifically perverse. Uh, they are also dangerous, for they help to harbour and to incubate the culture in which a father can extract that word evil from its context and use it to torment and to shame and to hurt his own son. Now, I believe as a parent we have to have our children's backs. I believe that that's what we are on this earth to do, to protect our children, to keep them safe, to affirm them, to encourage them. So, I've worried since last May about that young man's mental health, for not all human beings have the same realm of coping skills enough to emerge safely and mentally well from what has to be a very toxic home environment. Some cope well and some just plain don't. And this report tells us, with the extraordinary level of science and um, academic research, with this huge body of academic credibility, it tells us how much we should be worried about the legacy of homophobia and the ongoing damage that it's inflicting on just way too many young people whose coping skills are not as strong and as resolute and as resilient as we would like them to be. The levels of stress, anxiety, depression, drug abuse, self-harm and suicide among the LGBTI community are just plain unacceptable and they are our problem, everybody's problem, not just a problem for the LGBTI communities but they're a problem for all of us as civic society. The problems as we heard and have read in the report are particularly, they're at their worst in our, at, at, at second level, in our second level schools. And we've heard, you know, we've heard from Kira of a really very positive, um, a very positive message. Um, we know that um, there are, there's evidence of positive change and we can actually see in the report the difference across the generations. The lesbian and gay communities now coming out from the shadows, becoming more confident but the bisexual, the transgender, the intersex communities still in the shadows, because most of us hadn't got our heads around those labels. And I include myself among, you know, only with the help of some of my friends here that I remember, you know, in, in writing my notes for today to include the transgender and the bisexual and the intersex, it, rather than just roll off the tip of the tongue, you know, lesbian and gay. And even to throw out words like homophobic, I have to remember to put in there you know, the, the phobia against gender identity. Because these things, this new language we have to draw from the, from the shadows into the light to ensure that everybody is on the road into the light. So the LGBTI community is, it's our problem. Their problems are our problems. And it breaks my heart to think just of the significant numbers Right now, as we are gathered here, the very significant numbers of sad and fearful teenagers who are afraid to go to school, they're afraid to be in school, they're afraid of being picked on because of their sexual orientation, their gender identity. They're uncomfortable in themselves. They're full of dread. What a way to be in your teenage life, you know. What a, what a way to be. And does anybody in this room or anywhere else 
think that this is the kind of atmosphere that's going to help their mental health, that's going to help them pay attention to their studies? Is it going to help them to have a steady growth into a comfortable and confident adulthood? Well, we've heard from Daniel, no, it's not. No, it's not. And we've heard from Kira. no, it's not. The evidence is in, in this report, of that secret world of suffering that lies behind and is so carefully hidden by, as it was always intended to be, of course, by the architecture and the architects of homophobia. Our job, and the job of all of those who are committed to a society that is based on real equality, is to look out for and to care for the mental well-being of our growing children, to ensure that when they are at school, they are safe. I mean, I was writing this weeks ago. Daniel could have written it for me. He used the very words that I was using to make sure that when they are at school, they're safe. When they're in their own homes, they are safe. That they are not hearing things that are like daggers to their very souls. When they are walking the streets, that they are safe. A lot of them are quite simply not safe right now. That's the truth of it. It's really encouraging, though, from this report to hear what happens when they go to university and to college and into many of the workplaces. The work that has been done is transforming those environments, has transformed those environments, and that many of them now, these are increasingly safe and welcoming spaces. That's really encouraging for the LGBTI community, and I think it's encouraging for all of us, you know, as parents. Um, to know that, 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 the, that over the years that we've, and the generations that we've had these debates, they have changed people's thinking. They've changed and influenced practice in spaces that were once upon a time also closed spaces. I mean, I think back to my own university days, which, okay, it was the last century and the last millennium, <laughs> yeah, fair enough, but um, we did not discuss these issues. They were still taboo. There was an omerta around the discussion of them. It was very much, everything was sotto voce. But today, we still have spaces which are highly unsafe. And what we know that is encouraging is wonderful and it's good, but it's just not yet enough. Parents need reassurance that the mental well-being of their LGBTI children is high among the priorities of schools and the teachers to whom they entrust their loved children to be educated. Our LGBTI children need re reassurance that the schools that we as parents have chosen for them are places where they're going to experience healthy attitudes to them, acceptance, our citizens, whose taxes fund our schools, are entitled to know that our taxpayers' money is conscientiously invested in, a school, experiences, in school experiences that do not pose a special risk to LGBTI students, and that that money is invested well in helping to build up and not to threaten their mental resilience. A large part of that task involves shifting the kilter of attitudes, challenging those that foster homophobia, presenting the scientific evidence, as in this report. Um, and in this report, the evidence is of the damage that is inflicted by unhealthy, disordered, evil attitudes, behaviours, practices, including silence and very studied denial. That's why this scholarly report is, in my view, as essential and revealing as it is horrifying. The ongoing damage is just undeniable. That it involves so many young people is just plain tragic. But that it is soluble is good news, because the report shows the progress we can make when we make an effort. In May 2015, the Irish people convincingly showed their commitment to levelling the playing field for our LGBTI citizens. And I know that the citizens of Ireland, when they read this report, when they hear it, and it was good to see it so well covered in the main newspapers this morning, I know that they will be heart sore to know of the torment 
that so many of our young people are enduring, particularly the young teenagers. They'll want to see a very different story when the next report is done in five or six years' time. For the children, like I have a little grandchild just born um, three weeks ago, and we just have the most wonderful chance to make this country the best place in the world, an absolute shining light of how life could be and should be lived for our LGBTI citizens. We know it's not going to happen by chance. It can only happen by change. It's as simple as that. I believe that last year we committed to that change in a very real way. And now we have to follow through by drilling down through those centuries of sediment um, to the very heart's core of the problem, releasing the innate goodness, the decency, the egalitarian sensibility that Ireland is capable of. The children who are in the cots and the buggies today, they're going to discover their sexual identity in 12, 13 years time. So they have the right, they don't know it yet and they can't articulate it, they rely on us to articulate it for them, um, but they have the right to grow into mentally healthy and well-adjusted teenagers, not to have their lives skewed into dysfunctional shapes by attitudes they did not create and which we have the opportunity now to dismantle, to get out of the way so that their little lives do not become an unnecessary obstacle course. So we have to do the job now to ensure that no bully and no homophobic culture will deprive them of the right to grow up with the mental strength and resilience to be whoever and whatever they are. I'm so grateful to Glenn, so grateful to belong to, to the LGBTI community who took part so wholeheartedly in this research, to the National Office for Suicide Prevention for commissioning it, but in particular uh, to Professor Higgins and her fantastic team for committing um, to this project and having at its heart the well-being of our LGBTI community. And, of course, the well-being of our country, because they are one and the same thing. When our LGBTI community, when we can say they are happy and well and safe and confident, then our country is a much better place to be, a much happier place to be. But anyway, the evidence is in, it's irrefutable, irrefutable evidence of the continuing damage inflicted on individuals by negative attitudes to LGBTI identities. The quicker, the more effectively we respond to the evidence, the better will be the lives of today's unborn, newly born, and the little kids who are now five years of age in school and who, please goodness, you know, when the next report is done and the report after that is done, and we've seen the trajectory of improvement, their lives will be so qualitatively different from many of the lives that are recorded here. And that's the important thing to remember. The, this, this is not the measurement in inches and feet of people. This is the measurement of lives lived, of stories told, of hearts opened, of voices speaking out of their experience. Can we be sure that the little kids now who are starting at primary school or heading into second level, that their school experience will be positive, that it will be affirming, no matter what their sexual identity? I don't think we can say right now that we can be, unfortunately. Will they become the victims of homophobia? Will some of them become homophobic bullies? We don't know. Well, actually, we do. It's true they will. And will some self-harm and end their lives because they can't face the pain of being bullied or of exclusion or discrimination or self-doubt or because of a father or mother who dares to use the word evil of them? All of that is happening in our country today. It's in the report. That's how we know. That's how we know. It's not about anecdote anymore. It's about science. And if we don't want it in the next report, then what we do now, what we do now provokes the change. So I want to strongly ask all parents, teachers, 
school governors, patrons, politicians, those who are involved in the lives of our young people in whatever way they are involved in providing services to them or merely nurturing them. I want them to take this report to heart, to make it their vocation, their purpose in life, to do whatever it takes to end the tragic and unnecessary waste of beautiful young lives that should be blossoming, should be flourishing, should be happy, could be happy, and please God will be happy if we remember not chance, only change can make this happen. This report is the leaven that raises, raises the cake. That's what it has to be. This is the report that helps us, gives us what we need, the ammunition we need to make the changes. I'm just so proud of what you've accomplished here. And I hope in five years' time that when we gather, we'll be so proud of what our country has accomplished. I believe the will is there. I think it spoke to us profoundly on May 23rd. Our job now to capture that will and give it structure and focus. That's what the report helps us to do. Gorambila Milimahagiv.